Okay, you're, handouts. you're ready. We're good? Yep. I have two handouts here, and uh, one's on the, the effects of different pest management practices in almonds. The other one's a little bit I'm going to use. It's a seasonal overposition from navel orange one, but I want to use this to show you how to, to kind of predict how to get in for early harvest, predict when that time, when a little ahead of time, when you should be looking at early harvest. Okay, the first thing I want to tell you today is that this is a hard shell orchard. Buttes, Padres, and that management in a hard shell of, is completely different than what we do from a soft shell orchard. And one, and one of the key points I want to make is when we talk, when you hear the term hull split, you know, every variety hull splits, but they hull split at different times. The generic hull split term we're talking about really is for nonpareils. That is the key, and we do that because nonpareils, and it used to be Mission or uh, uh, Merced varieties. You don't see that anymore. The the split on that is when the nut becomes susceptible. So from this period on, if for nonpareils, from this period on to when you get to harvest is really the only time, the only time that navel orange worm will get into that nut. And that's a key uh, factor in determining the management. When we treat for navel orange worm, I'm focusing here a little bit on navel orange worm in May, we're actually trying to prevent that generation from cycling on old mummies uh, that are here. And your management will differ a little bit. This is a beautifully isolated orchard and it's a hard shell orchard, so the potential for navel orange worm damage is extremely low here but if you're near pistachios or you're near other almonds or you're near walnuts pistachios in particular then you don't have complete control over what you do in your orchard and you may have to do a little more intensive insecticide management certainly on the soft shell uh, varieties such a, as nonpareil and something like uh, Fritz that would be harvested later later in the season. There's a couple of things that I do want to show you today. Um, before I get into this, we'll talk a little bit about these strikes in the tree. This is very similar. There's two insects that cause these strikes. Um, and that's a little terminal wilting here. One is peach twig borer, which we are very concerned with in almonds. Usually if you've had a dormant spray, it's not an, an issue. Um, or you've had a May or a hull split spray, you'll be able to control this. Again, twig borer is much like navel orange worm in that it really is not a serious problem uh, until the hulls open up and are susceptible. They can go into a green nut, but it's not very often that they do. The other one, and that is the case here that causes this, is oriental fruit moth, which is a huge problem on peaches and nectarines. Um, uh, in quince, but it's not really a particular problem in almonds. This is caused by uh, oriental fruit moth, and I haven't seen the larvae, but oriental fruit moth causes this tip to die back a little bit further back than twig borer. Twig borer will just leave a little shoot. You might be able to pick one here. This is the key. I bet if we peel this one right here, we're going to find an OFM right in there. It's just that generation is starting, and I'll I'll show that to you after I get done with the rest of the talk. This is the real, actually in the old days, in the old days, this is what, this wilting like this uh, was when we determined that may spray timing for peach twig borer. It showed that the larvae were out, they're beginning to move around. You put that on as they first begin to go into the twig. This is a real important thing to look at right now. So after the meeting, I want you to each take a look at this. Um, one other thing, I know a lot of people are concerned with uh, um, uh, plant bug damage. There are, there are some gumming nuts here. I don't know what's causing it. It's not plant bug. But again, I'm going to have these here. I want you to look at it. I actually think it's probably a relationship to salt damage because we're seeing salt tip burn on those trees that have this little gumming showing up. I haven't seen it on any other variety. I believe this is butte, but there is gumming. It's not caused by plant bug damage. Uh, 
but that process, okay, I know when you look for this type of damage, you tend to focus on the nut. But I want you to, to, to say, okay, okay, we see that, is there something else on that tree that is also a little abnormal? In this case, you can walk over a little later, not only is there a little gumming on the nut, there's that tip burn on the leaf. I know many of you are planting almonds on, on um, sodic type soils, moderate sodic soils, and you'll often get that tip burn where it browns at the tip of the leaf. I want you to use that in terms of your problem solving ability. So if you go in to ask someone about a problem, okay, say I'm finding this, and not just that I'm finding gumming, talk a little bit about uh, what other symptoms the tree might be showing. So it's, it's one of those little things that you try to say, okay, what else is happening here that might have somebody, help somebody that's not in the orchard solve that problem. So I'm not getting to the heart of the uh, issue yet. So, so let's first, now again, right now I'm talking uh, primarily non-parels. I don't particularly worry about the hard shell varieties in terms of management, both for uh, navel, navel orange worm and twig bore. I do think you need a preventative for twig bore. Um, either in the bloom time or as a dormant spray, but I, I'm not a, a real big believer of an annual spray on the hard shell varieties. Number one, well, the main reason is because the shell is so hard that it's very difficult for navel orange worm, and unless you're extremely late uh, or near a huge pressure area for navel orange worm, you're not going to get serious infestation. I'm talking infestation of anywhere uh, upwards of a percent or a percent and a half. Soft shell variety is a little bit different. I know that's easy for me to say because I'm here without the orchard. I'm here without that input that you've all put in and you want to be safe on this. And, uh, but you've got a lot more leeway, as you all know, on hard shell varieties than, uh, than uh, non-parel here. Most areas were progressing well into the non-parel hull split. We're a lot ahead of last year's uh, progression and so the nuts are now susceptible and uh, Jenna has been picking up egg laying in those orchards that uh, in all the orchards but particularly in those orchards uh, that have hull split. Now I want you to look at this one sheet the table sheet first. Now I've had I've had this out before and I want you to get an idea uh, of what these various practices uh, the level of control and really it's just to me I've taken this out of the Almond Integrated Pest Management Manual for Almonds. You can get much of this information online, but if you don't have this and you're really curious, you ought to have this manual. It really is a good manual. There's beautiful photos in it, um, and, and it will help you solve a lot of uh, problems that you might see in your orchard. But, so let's just go down this, and again, here we're talking about navel orange worm. The insect management practice. If you did a winter cleanup uh, to an or, uh, a level of two nuts per tree, and that pretty well, or less, if you're near an external source of infestation, in other words, something like pistachios uh, next to you, you can reduce, by just that simple practice, you're reducing your damage level anywhere from 50 to 70 percent, depending on how, how, um, how big that external source is. Uh, if you're isolated like this orchard is, and you've got, again, we're dealing with non-parels here, you can reduce that potential for damage by 70 and 80, and this has all been documented in our experimental work, by 70 to 80 percent. This is work that farm advisors up and down the state have put together and developed this table with. If you do early harvest, and that's what I'm going to talk about on that other sheet, in other words, we used to talk about, and again, on non-parels, uh, being able to harvest. This isn't the complete answer, but being able to harvest, once you get 90 to 95 percent hull split throughout the orchard, you should be able to go in and harvest that orchard. I mean, the nuts will come off the tree. The real confounding factor is 
how much bark slippage is on will occur when you put that uh, shaker on the tree. That I think is going to be more of a determinant of uh, when you can actually go in if you're damaging the tree or not because you do not want to cause uh, what we used to call ceratocystis canker uh, or bark damage when you shake the tree. But early harvest by, by the time you right at 100%, uh, if you do that, I, it, it's huge, 70% reduction in your potential for damage. So let's say you did both those. Let's say two trees per less and you're isolated. You've got a 70% reduction in your potential for damage. You do early harvest, that's another 70% on top of that. And those are two foundation non-chemical control techniques that are proven to work. Now whether you can make them work in your own orchard is a different issue. I mean that's something you have to know about the ground, how you water. I think it really ties in though to what David has talked about into culturally managing hull rot by reducing a little bit of deficit irrigation. By doing that you don't allow that bark trunk to remain green. You're reducing your damage uh, by not increasing the humidity of the orchard from uh, hull rot and you're also making it easier to remove those nuts to the tree so that that technique that we use to manage hull rot is is important more than just in terms of hull rot but allowing you to get in to early shake personally I know most of you um, have moderate acreages I would get a harvester I would I, I know that's a big outlay but if you can do your own harvesting and schedule it yourself instead of waiting you know if you're a small grower you're on the tail end of that harvesting list so it, it eliminates a lot of cultural uh, potentials or uh, advantages that you may have but if you have your own harvester you can get in when that uh, timing is ready and I think I, I, I haven't put the pencil to this but if you really think, I don't, I don't know what level of damage you're getting, but if you're getting 4%, 3 or 4%, uh, you're probably going to pay for that, that harvester in a few years by being able to get in and timing that early harvest. I just want to put that in your mind to think about um, what you can do with your own harvester on timing early harvest, because that is a real key for naval orange room control. I don't think on a hard shell that's that big a, an issue, but if you're growing non-parels, uh, that's something that you want to want to consider. So here it shows that if you did one and one A and two combined overall, your your uh, reduction p potential is 75 percent. If you do one a, B and two combined, you've got 80 to 90 percent reduction. Now. In terms of uh, the two sprays, I want you to look at five and six here. Whether you do, these are single sprays, they're not combination sprays. Whether you do a May, what you do a May spray, uh, I'm laughing because I'm in and out of this focus here. You can have a picture of my chest. Um, whoa. <laughs> Whether you do a May spray, all these little jokes are running through my mind right now, so <laughs> forgive me. Uh, whether you do a May spray or a hull split spray here, that single spray will has a potential of 40 to 60. In general, we say a well-timed spray. Hull split, we base it on uh, less than 5% hull split. You'll get about 50 to 60% control. The further off you are in delaying that spray, the less effective that spray is. So, that's a real key thing to remember. It's like paying maybe uh, if you did a late hull split spray and I'm talking to 60, 70 percent or even 100 percent hull split, you're probably, look at it in terms of paying a third more for your insecticide and simply in reduced control of what you're getting. Again, primarily focusing on navel orange worm. So do you have any questions about this? I know I hit hard on this. I think I've given this chart before, but I want you to remember the, these are the basic facts that you need to keep in your mind in approaching naval orange worm control. Okay? Any questions on this? If you're early harvest, like you have trouble with moisture, 
Yes. You do. There are, there are he, the question was on early harvest, are there le troubles with moisture? And certainly last year that was the case. You know, there's a level that I think that the processor will take. Uh, you may have to lay them on the ground a little bit more. And that means that if you didn't do ant control, that time of period on the ground is going to be very important because you can lose a lot of uh, nuts from ant. And the ants will all, again, soft cell varieties. I'm, I'm kind of getting off here. The ants will only feed once the nuts are on the ground unless you do this. And that you see the they will learn, and again, on, it's not on hard shell. This the gene is all right here in Eric because these are hard shells. The ant can't get in past the hard shell. But if this were a soft shell vari uh, variety, and those open, they they'll be feeding on these lower nuts from the period that hull opens till the time you get in. So instead of normally six, seven, eight days that you'd have that they're on the ground, they're exposed from July to when you get into mid-August or September. I know that's dollars. When you see that lower yield, you say that's dollars, but believe me, they'll cause you headaches if you have not controlled your ants. They will move up. It's funny, they won't go up the, the trunk, but they will feed on these lower branches that, <coughs> that touch the soil, the, the ground. So keep that in mind. I see that a lot on the west side. And I know a lot of you out here are hard shell varieties. Again, hard shells are not prob a problem with ants. So, I don't know how you control that other than uh, the question was on the moisture, but I think that management of water for a hull rot will help you control the moisture in the nut. David, I'm gonna ask you to maybe address that when you get up here, all right? Okay, so, got now to this page. So this is, uh, this one is, right now is the overposition of navel orange worm. It shows the May period up till about June 20th. This is on egg traps, not on a pheromone trap, okay? This is something that uh, Jenna has been monitoring in your orchards. We've got three in each orchard. See that huge? Now, this wintering, this overwintering one, the only thing these can survive on are mummy nuts. You take mummy nuts away from that orchard and they die. That's why sanitation is so important. If you get those mummy nuts out of the orchard, this is suicidal. If you have mummy nuts in the orchard, it is no longer suicidal. They will regenerate on those mummies. You'll have a next generation here. In this case, we got our, our overposition of second generation eggs on the second or the uh, 24th of July. Pretty, uh, uh, 24th of June, excuse me. Hull split the 5th of July. And then it drops down. This second generation that we're in, we're right in the heart of now, causes very little damage. It really doesn't cause much damage. In general, even in a pretty severely infested orchard, at the end of the second generation, you may have 2% if you did nothing, all right? Where you get killed is this third generation. That's why early harvest becomes very critical. This generation that starts on a, in, in Bakersfield, this was in Wasco actually, on about the, the uh, 10th of August, the longer those nuts, non-perels again, are exposed during this period of time, the more infestation you have. So what we try to do, in the past you couldn't, the, in the past we couldn't treat in that August period well, for a number of reasons. You're not going to a lot of nuts off, but it was really based on pre-harvest intervals for products like Guthion, Lorsban, and Imidan. So we focused pretty much on treating in this May, May period. And over and over again, those trials showed that if we treated between 1 and 10% hull split, we've gotten much better control than if we've gone past 20, 25% hull split. So that's where that timing, and the timing is very important. Um, maybe I'm a little old school on this, but I do feel, 
I know nonpareils have a pollinator variety in there, or a pollinizer variety. I treat every row. I treat every row. Some people don't. Still up to debate uh, on whether you can go alternate rows, but I feel treat it thoroughly. Do it at two to two and a half miles an hour. You, with the products such as Intrepid, Altacore, uh, Belt, um, there's a new one coming out, Proclaim. They're all very, very effective. Now these are products that don't have secondary effects. They're effective on the target pests. They generally control either the small larvae or the eggs. So if you can get them in as navel orange worm is ovipausing, you're going to do a very, very good job of controlling it. Now there are other products. The pyrethroids are much cheaper, much cheaper. They are effective, primarily targeted. They primarily target the larvae. You will get some adult kill with them. And you say, well, if I'm getting adult kill, that should sh result in better control. It sounds right, but when you compare the two, the end result and the infestation is no different. And when I'm saying comparing the two, I'm talking about a product like Intrepid or Altacore versus uh, a product like the old product was Asana or Warrior. Yes, you might be able to get the adults, but in the end result of what the infestation is, we've not shown any difference. And in fact, these reduced risk materials are always coming really right at the very top. I think I showed you earlier this spring some work that we did with, I did with Brent Holtz, where Intrepid and Proclaim actually did an excellent, excellent job on naval orange worm control on two varieties. Carmel as well. So, we try right now to control here at the initiation of hull split when the nuts become susceptible. Now, they, we may have egg laying ahead of that, and, uh, but really the nuts do not become susceptible until hull split occurs. I want to go into one other little point here, and it can be a little bit confusing, but I want you to look at when we begin using the egg traps, how to predict when to go in for early harvest. We know that a generation of naval orange worms is about 1,025 degree days. This is based on 54, I think, and, and uh, 90 degrees is the upper and lower threshold. By predicting, by using the biofix of when we first got, the date that we first got the second generation increase in eggs, you can use historical data to predict when 1,024 degree days will come, and that means that's when the third generation develops. So that's the date that you want to be in ahead of to reduce any damage from that ger third generation. And I want you to show. Uh, I want to show you what we did. We predicted from 624 um, by observing these age uh, that uh, 1,000. 24 degree days would be on 810. Up uh, at 1014. We observed from that time, okay, this is what the predicted was. We actually observed that it was 1017. That's less than a day's difference in timing. So I feel, and, and this is, I've showed, I'm using this as just one example. I've got a lot of years that we've done this. In that period from Generation A lay in, in July to when the next generation starts is very consistent. It's been between 1,000 and 1,100 degree days. And that simply tells you, you know, if I really want those nuts clean without additional spraying in here, that's the date I need to get into. Now, whether you can do that or not because of the condition of the tree, the condition of the nuts, uh, that's another story. But it gives you an idea of the potential of using a cultural technique. Honestly, those two techniques, winter sanitation and early harvest, are really, really key in keeping your damage low. Certainly more so on Carmel's, Nonpareil's, uh, Fritz, um, maybe even in some cases Monterey's. But um, that pretty much is what I've got to say. Um, I'll take a little bit more time 
to show you this. Um, I might have David come up and let and let you give your talk first, David. Yeah. Um, but are there any other questions, Frank? Yes. Uh, as far as ants this year, have you noticed there's been a reduction of ants? I have. I mean, it's so variable between orchards. I haven't. I haven't seen that, but I haven't. I, are you noticing it or? We treat every year, and this year we just kind of spot treated around the edges because we didn't see the ants like we have in the past. I, that's why I didn't know. Um, if you've done that, you usually put it on about uh, early June. Late, yeah, late May, early June. Okay, right. yeah. The baits, I mean, honestly, as we've gone to drip irrigation and non-tillage, uh, ants are becoming one of those annual problems that um, I don't even. If you've got them in your orchard, the baits are so cheap; it's easy enough to control them. They're not. Uh, uh, affecting any environmental quality so I think a lot of people have gone to that and that really reduces uh, the potential for damage uh, I don't want to get too far into the ant thing but they are a very confusing pest to deal with because some years you can have a huge population but if when you put the nuts on the ground if the temperatures are above 95 degrees while they're drying you won't have any damage um, if it's above 95 while the nuts are drying, they don't forage out of their nest. So the species that we have. So that's why it's it's so confusing. Uh, you get a couple of years like that, a grower says, well, I don't need to treat. Then you get a year when you're drying nuts on 80 to 85 and you get nailed uh, because they do forage below 95. So it's pretty confusing, but yes. Well, maybe if you yeah. could comment or, or David on uh comparison of ground mummies versus tree mummies. Because I've kind of seen some data from down south that the ground mummies are now almost as bad as the tree mummies. Um, the, some of that data shows that on, on pistachios it's huge. On uh, almonds not as much as long. Remember one little factor on navel orange worm is they don't oviposit on the ground. Okay? So if you do, yeah, they'll, they'll cycle on the ground much like, an, and what I mean cycle on the ground, if there's a cluster of nuts like you have in your cabinet, and they'll regenerate on that, but if a nut, if, you, if you've got clean nuts on the, uh, if you've cleaned the orchard tops, what you've got on the orchard floor is not an issue. That cycling actually happens in pistachios because it's just like thousands of these small nuts where they just, it's like they're in a package and they keep cycling there. They don't have to fly down. But in, on almonds, the number of nuts that remain are, are on the ground are very small. I still suggest that you do try to destroy those, particularly if you had a lot of mummies that were up in the tree you get a hundred or so below the tree, I'd come through and flail those if I could. But it is less a factor in almonds than it is on pistachios. So, well, can you explain that cycling? You mean you get you get movement out of the top to the ones on the ground and off the ground up to the top? Is that what you mean by cycling? Okay. Or, no. Oh, I'm just confused okay. by that, I'm sorry. How many of you have had an insect infestation in the home? Okay. on uh, on insects even they're in grain or in almond, not necessarily almonds. What happens, you get a little enclosed area, the larvae develop, they pupate, and the moths are right there. They mate, the cycle, or the beetles are right there. And they cycle and regenerate. They don't have to fly up or down. In almonds, you, have, you never have that cluster, very seldom you have a lot of mummies at the base of the tree, so they're not close enough for them to recycle and regenerate. In pistachios, that's not the case. You get a lot of those nuts that are just essentially your home uh, of food area, and they will regenerate and cycle on those nuts on the ground without ever flying. So the proximity of, of how, how close right. the nuts are when you're looking at the panicle and the pistachio is what really aids that cycling. Right, exactly. Usually in pistachios, it's because the nuts come out of the bin. You don't get them all in the bin, and so you get hundreds of these nuts at the base of the tree. 
Some of those nuts will have navel orange worm in them, some won't. But they'll be able to regenerate each year on the ground. In almonds, we never have that level because the orchard floor is so clean. So the re potential for that recycling is, is much less. I mean, I would flail. It's just something I would do if you got the equipment. But the density is not as high as what we The density is before. not as high. They're not touching okay. each other. And that's what I'm talking about. Gotcha. They'll, they don't have to mate, fly, and then come back down. They cycle because they're in, in close, uh, they're touching. Gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay, any other questions? Yes. We're talking about some of the materials, Trepid and Belt. Yeah. Been using Trepid a number of years and we're having great results. Do you think we're going to get into a resistance problem? We could. We could. I mean, you know, there's a thing, it is a, a what they call an insect growth regulator. And one of the benefits of that, it's almost like um, pheromone mating disruption. You know, if, if they do develop resistance, it's almost a suicidal thing. But I do think we can get into that. I would. Alter Intrepid is relatively cheap of the newer materials, probably the best material we have, I, I personally think. But I would alternate, if you're trying to do something uh, near water or where you're worried about water contamination, I, uh, uh, I would s cycle with Altacor or Belt or even Proclaim. This Proclaim looks pretty good. How about with like the ant baits? Yes. And I noticed the last couple, we've used Clinch for a number of years. The yeah. last two, not this year, but last two years we treat, I noticed around the ends I'd see before more. you would see, which they, they would just stop. The last two years, it's not slowing them down like it was. We think we're building resistance there too, maybe? There's a possibility. I, I hate to jump into that, but yeah. there's always a... I mean, I think our efficiency of that control is is uh, not very good, so the chances of resistance, but the, the genetics of a colony are pretty similar. So if you all of a sudden get it, it's not one or two individual. It's uh, it's a huge colony turnover. They're, all, they're such a social animal. I, you know, what is the other one? Uh, extinguish. Extinguish. Yeah. Yeah, they're two different materials. You might. Uh, well, we I don't know what the cost material. difference is, but I'd, I'd switch, and they've both been very effective. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Walt. Let me just uh, tell you that Walt.